Pastor John here, inviting you to join my wife Denise and myself as we plunge into the depths of God's Word, growing ever closer to Him. I pray that He gives us all eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to understand. Now join us in our service already in progress. God bless you. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Welcome back to the channel this morning. We love you. God bless you. We're so happy to be here this morning. Um, prayer request. Um, our evangelist in Pakistan this morning, he was not available for church. We weren't able to minister to them this morning. He has an aunt who is in the hospital she had a heart attack, I think, last night, and he had to drive over to another city. So please be in prayer for uh, Pastor Evangelist Raul Masi, his aunt. I, I, at this time, I don't know what her name is. I will give you an update when I know. Open with me this morning in your Bibles to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel we're going to be reading chapter 30. We're going to be reading verses 1 through 15. 1 Samuel 30, 1 through 15. And it came to pass, when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day, that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag, and smitten Ziklag, and burned it with fire, and had taken the women captives that were therein. They slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away, and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. Then David and the people that were there lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives were taken captives, Ahinoam the Jezreelitess and Abigail the wife of Nabal the Carmelite. And David was greatly distressed. I think any of us would have been. For the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord, his God. And David said to Abiathar, the priest, Ahimelech's son, I pray thee, bring me the hither the ephod, and Abiathar brought thither the ephod to David. If you don't know what the ephod was, it was a vest that they would put on. And it had different colored stones in it for all the tribes of Israel. And God would speak to him through the ephod. And David inquired at the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop and overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue. For thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. So David went, he and the six hundred men that were with him, and came to the brook Bezor, where those that were left behind stayed. But David pursued, he and four hundred men, for two hundred men abode behind, which were so faint, that they could not go up over the brook Bezor. And they found an Egyptian in the field, and brought him to David, and gave him bread, and he did eat. And they made him drink water, and they gave him a piece of cake of figs, and two clusters of raisins. And when he had eaten, his spirit came again to him. For he had eaten no bread nor drunk any water for three days and three nights. And David said unto him, unto him, To whom belongest thou, and whence art thou? 
And he said, I am a young man of Egypt, a servant to an Amalekite. And my master left me because three days ago I fell sick. And we made an invasion upon the south of the Cherethites, and upon the coast which belongeth to Judah, and upon the south of Caleb. And we burnt Ziklag with fire. And David said unto him, Canst thou bring me down to this company? And he said, Swear unto me by God that thou wilt neither kill me nor deliver me into the hands of my master, and I will bring thee down to this company. Father God, I come before you in the name of Jesus, Lord God. I humble myself in your presence. I am not able to do this. Holy Spirit, I ask you to breathe life upon this word. Anoint these lips of clay and let me speak your words and your words alone. Give us all eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to understand. And we give you all the glory, the honor, and the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. The title of my message this morning is Meaner Than a Junkyard Dog. Anybody that's ever gotten close to a junkyard after closing time can relate to what I'm talking about. These dogs, they put some of the most vicious attack dogs to roam around inside of these junkyards at nighttime. You would rather get caught by the owners or by the police to let than to let one of these dogs get a hold of you. Any of you that have ever seen a dog inside of the perimeter of a fence, you're going to notice one thing. There is going to be a rut that is worn out along the perimeter of the fence because that dog will patrol the perimeter of the fence. Folks, we have to hedge ourselves in. And we have to patrol that hedge lest the enemy gets an advantage and breaks through. And we need to be there to be meaner than a junkyard dog when he tries to break through. Sometimes he gets through and we get attacked. Sometimes we get knocked flat on our face. But I'm going to give you some things that we need to do after an attack. There are some things that we should do before an attack, but right now we're going to talk about what do we do after an attack. David and his men were not there to protect the city. And it was smitten. It was burned to the ground and all of their wives, sons and daughters were taken. What do you do after an attack? Number one, we just mentioned this. If it's possible, we need to stop it at the door. Home invasions. Almost every home invasion that I have seen on film has started off with somebody knocking at the door. Many times they will send a young lady to the door to feign some problem that she's having while her accomplices are sneaking in from the sides. And while you're standing there talking to the young lady, when they get close enough, they rush in, take you into the house, and to begin to spoil your house and take your goods. On Wednesday night, I laid down in bed. Now, there was a lady on my job who was sick wearing a mask, and I had been around her. Wednesday night, I laid in bed, and I began to feel that pulsating in my body like you get when you get the flu. Folks, I haven't had the flu in close to 20 years, and I'm not about to have it now. I've gone through the entire COVID-19 pandemic without wearing a mask unless I was forced to. I haven't taken the vaccine. I have not contracted it. And as I lay in bed feeling that, knowing that was the onset of a flu coming on to me, I stopped it at the door. I said, no, 
I'm not going to have this. And I declare and decree that every evil germ that touches my body will die by the fire of God in the name of Jesus. Why do I say every evil germ? Because there are some germs that we have to have in our body. They're called probiotics. They help with our digestion. So you don't want every germ to die because that could lead you open to be sick. The next morning, I felt great. No sign, no trace of any flu or anything. Now, this is the same thing with an argument. I learned this, I'm going to tell you, I learned this with my parents. I haven't always had the greatest, um, I haven't always had the greatest relationship with my parents. And I got a hold of this teaching uh, about basically what's coming out of my mouth. You know, a lot of times we have somebody in our lives that antagonizes us and we begin to say things like, that guy is always such a jerk to me. He always does this, he always does this and that and the other thing. But what are we doing? Proverbs, I uh, believe it's 19, 21 says that death and life are in the power of the tongue and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. If you're speaking that somebody is always a jerk to you, guess what? They're always going to be a jerk to you. And I had been going around saying, that, you know, I, I want to go to my parents, but every time I go over there, I can't be there ten minutes before we're in an argument. And guess what? I had exactly what I was saying. And then one day, I said, you know what? I got a hold of that teaching. I said, I'm not going to do that anymore. And I began to bind up any spirits of discord and strife before I would go over to my parents' house. We have a great relationship today. We rarely get into any arguments anymore. Now with my son, with my youngest son, sometimes that's a little bit different because sometimes I don't realize that there's a spiritual attack happening until we're already in an argument. But once I realize it, I'll go off to a corner and I'll bind up the spirit and then it stops. Now that's something else that hasn't happened in a while, but it, you know, it's just something to think about. Sometimes, you know, because the enemy is slick. He's sneaky. <laughs> and he can get one over on you really easy sometimes. But the thing about it is, if you can stop it at the door, I want you to think about something. If some young lady who was part of a home invasion comes to the door and knocks on the door, and then the next thing she hears is some vicious dog on the other side of that door, I think they're going to abort the home invasion rather than risk getting a dog attack. That's what my personal opinion is. Stop it at the door if it's possible. Number two, encourage yourself. Verse 6 said, David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. Now he could have whined and complained about it. Oh, woe is me. My wife and children are gone. Everybody's against me. They want to stone me. No, he encouraged himself in the Lord. After you assess the situation and all of the facts, it's time to encourage yourself. Recall God's word. Romans 8.28 says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. And recall your past. Re recall your past victories. If you were to read, I'm not going to go there because of time, but if you would read 1 Samuel 17.28, 34 through 37, this is when Goliath was threatening Israel and defying the armies of God. What did David do? David got meaner than a junkyard dog, is what I'm going to tell you he did. David went to Saul and said, Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he defies the armies of God? 
While all the grown men, all of the seasoned veteran warriors were in the trenches trembling, a young man, 14 to 17 year old, stood up and wasn't going to have any of it. And King Saul told him, you can't go up against this man. You're just a youth. And he's been a man of war since his youth. And David said, there came a lion and a bear to take a sheep out of the flock. And he took him by the beard when he rose up against him, and he slew him. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of those. So recall your past victories and know that you still serve the same God that brought you through the victories in the past. David got meaner than a junkyard dog when he went up against Goliath. Goliath said, Am I a dog that you come to me with a staff and a stone? And he said, I'm going to feed your carcass to the birds. And David said, You're right, Goliath. The birds are going to have a good meal today. But they ain't eating no Hebrew meat. They're going to be eating Philistines. Amen. Hallelujah. Number three. Know who your enemy is. I can tell you right now, your enemy is not the person that you think it is. Your enemy is not your boss. Your enemy is not that antagonist on your job. Listen to me closely here. Your enemy is not your wife. Your enemy is not your husband. I, I say this all the time. I'm going to say it again. I love this. Something that Benny Hinn once said. He said, I wanted to hit that devil. But that woman's face was in the way. So we need to remember who our enemy really is. Ephesians 6.12 It says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Your enemy is not your wife but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Your enemy is not your neighbor that mocks you from time to time. When you begin to carry God's anointing, the enemy, while he knows he can't have you, he will do everything he can to deprive you of it for yourself. Why do you think every time when somebody starts bragging on somebody, they have a fall? You get up on the mountaintop and you have that mountaintop experience, you need to be careful and you need to keep your eyes open. Because right after that mountaintop experience, you better trust that the devil's going to come along and try to yank the rug right out from under your feet. Now I want you to think about something along these lines. Jesus, in the book of Matthew, chapter 3, he was baptized and the Holy Spirit came down and lighted upon him in the form of a dove. And the voice of God from heaven came out and said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Chapter 4 begins with him going out into the desert to be tempted of the devil. Even Jesus had that wonderful moment followed by a spiritual battle. So when you feel God's anointing all over you, you better know that there is an attack coming. And you better be ready to get meaner than a junkyard dog. Number four, what can you do when you're under attack, or when that attack has come. Inquire of God. Ask God for direction in the matter. Verse 8, David inquired of the Lord. Too many times Christians just want to accept it as being God's will. Oh, this sickness is just my cross to bear. 
Give me a Pentecostal break. You know, I, I remember one time I was in a hospital, not a hospital, it was a nursing home. And there was a young lady there, probably about 34, 35 years old, with cancer, laying in the bed, dying. And I was in there visiting with her for about a half an hour. I preached to this lady. I built her faith up and just prayed heaven down in that room. Faith to be healed. And a denominational pastor came right in on my heels telling this lady, don't fight this. God has you exactly where He wants you because He's trying to teach you something. Folks, God is not the author of sickness and disease. It's a simple rule that we can apply in things like this. God good, devil bad. You know, I, I, somebody commented on something about how Christians overlook when God kills people with hurricanes and disasters. And, and I'm like, are, are you serious? All of that kind of stuff came into existence because of man's sin. And God is not the author of it. The devil is the author of that kind of stuff. He's the author of sickness and disease. Don't blame God when something bad happens. Blame yourself for being a sinner. Because we are all sinners. And we live in a fallen, broken world. Number five, what can you do when you're under attack or the attack has already come? Number five, take it back. Don't just roll over and let the enemy take your stuff. Matthew eleven twelve 12 says, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. Take it back. Grow a spine and go into battle for it. You've got to get mean. Meaner than a junkyard dog. We need to learn to tell the devil, You want it? Come try to take it from me. I'm going to have it and a piece of you. Get mean about it, folks. John 10, 10 says, The thief cometh not, but for to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. But I am come, that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. The junkyard dog is there to stop the thief, to protect the property. And that's how we got to be. Things that we need to protect. Number one is our family. Stop letting the devil enslave your children. Pray for your family. You know why I'm here where I'm at today is because I had a mother that prayed for me every night and still does today. Pray for the family, but then pursue the thief. Go after the enemy if he's after your children. You need to learn a new type of prayer. It's called a warfare prayer. You know, we have weapons in our arsenal that the enemy does not have. My Bible tells me in 2 Corinthians 10, I think it's 3-5, through 5, but the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Folks, if you're going to pull down a stronghold, you've got to be mean. Meaner than a junkyard dog. Hebrews 1.13 says, But to which of the angels said he at any time, Sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be the heirs of salvation? 
We have angels at our disposal. See, the, 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 the truth is, we are no match for the devil in our flesh. Because man is made a little lower than the angels. But we've got God's angels on our side. We've got a crew, a wrecking crew, to go after the enemy and to pursue him. We're in the rear echelon, folks. We're not right on the front line. That's what we have angels for. Because we get tore up on the front line. And number two weapon that we have is the blood of Jesus Christ. You need to learn to fight the enemy with the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm telling you right now, folks, devils are terrified of the blood of Jesus Christ. When we do deliverance, one of the things we do is put worship music on, and I love to put on worship music that has songs about the blood. Well, where do you find that in the Bible? Where does the Bible say that? Okay, let's take a look at Revelation 12, 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they love not their lives unto the death. You have the blood of Jesus as a weapon against the enemy to overcome him. And lastly, you have your testimony. Just like David, I killed that bear and I killed that lion, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be as one of those. That's your testimony. Well, that was his testimony anyway. What's yours? And lastly, the things that we need to protect is our flesh. Now, I'm not necessarily talking about this physical body. I'm more talking about the soul here. Mark 14, 38 says, Watch and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. The spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak. Folks, you got to be meaner than a junkyard dog. You've got to patrol the perimeter of the hedges and make sure there's not a breach in the hedge for the enemy to get through. And if he does, what would a junkyard dog do? We need to get violent in our prayers for our children, for our family, and for our own well-being. There is a heaven to gain and there is a hell to shun. Which one are you going to choose? If you're here this morning or you're watching by TV on YouTube. I'm presenting this opportunity to you this morning to choose Christ. Heaven is a place of unspeakable joy. Everlasting joy. And hell is a place of torment, of weeping and gnashing of teeth. I want you to choose heaven this morning. Every head bowed and every eye closed. I want you to say this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. Be merciful to me, Lord. I know that my sins has separated me from God. And I know that you died to take away my sin. And I know that you died to take away my sin. It was my sin that put you on that cross. It was my sin that put you on that cross. I'm sorry for my sin, Jesus. I'm sorry for my sin, Jesus. Forgive me. Forgive me. Come into my heart. Come into my heart. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. And be my soon coming King. I confess to you as the Christ, the Son of the living God, that you died, you were dead for three days, you rose again, and you ascended to the right hand of God. Be my Savior, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Folks, if you said that prayer today and you really meant it in your heart, God bless you and welcome to the family of God. You are now my brother or my sister. Hallelujah. Welcome to the family of God. Hallelujah, Mama. <laughs> Glory to God. I love my mother-in-law. She's so sweet. 
And if you haven't done so, folks, listen, take a moment, hit the subscribe button, give us a like, and share the video with your friends. Until next time, God bless you. We love you, and we'll see you real soon. Hallelujah.